This talk is going to be split into three parts. The first part is I'm going to give a review of uh, what, what is called universal algebra. Um, and I'm going to give sort of a, a historical uh, viewpoint on this because the, the, what I know about universal algebra is from a book from the 90s. And the more sophisticated take is from the 60s. <laughs> so, um, but this is sort of a, a more elementary approach to the, su to the subject. Um, then part two, I'm going to give a review of adjoint functors. So um, why am I giving a review of adjoint functors? Well, so algebraic theories, uh, also known as Lavert theories, because they come, come from a, uh, come from uh, F. C. Lever, F. W. Lavert's 1963 PhD thesis. And to read Lavert is to know and love adjoint functors. So I actually, I, I've known about Lavert theories for a while, but when I was preparing for this talk, I went back and read the thesis. And I discovered all of these ways that he's using adjoint functors um, that I thought were really cool. So I decided to center. I decided to center my presentation of part three around adjoint functors. So I wanted to give a brief review of adjoint functors first. Um, part three is going to be Lavert theories, uh, and. I would say this is going to be like one star difficulty. This is going to be like two star difficulty. And then this is just going to be accelerating. <laughs> um, and we'll see how far I get. <laughs> um, are you going to talk explicitly at all about code or is, or is the theory? So, uh, and then I guess part four is going to be uh, a little bit of code after. Um, yeah, so we're working on uh, software that implements all of this. It ac we actually go farther than this. We implement generalized algebraic theories, um, but we, which is an extension, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, uh, and so I'm going to give a little demo of this. So you, you can be like, whoa, what's all this category theory happening? And then at the end, you'll see something. And hopefully, this will make a little bit more sense. <laughs> um, OK, so let's, let's start with um, part one, universal algebra. So universal algebra studies. Uh, Algebraic theories. What is an algebraic theory? Well, you've all heard of them. You've all heard of examples of algebraic theories before. So, for instance, a magma. You may not have heard of a magma, but it's probably the simplest algebraic theory. What is a magma? It's a set with a binary operation on it. Does that binary operation need to have any properties? No, it doesn't need to be associative. It doesn't need to be unital. It doesn't need to be anything. So, like, Matrices with subtraction form a magma. <laughs> um, cross product forms a magma. <laughs> um, so, so that's an algebraic theory. And a, a slightly nicer algebraic theory is monoid. So a monoid is a set with a binary operation on it that is unital. Yeah, I, there's a there's a unit and it's associative. So this is this is much nicer. So subtraction is not a monoid operation, but addition is, multiplication is, concatenation of strings is. Um, lattices. So if you take the collection of sub subsets of a of a given set and consider the operations of union and intersection. Those satisfy certain laws. For instance, they're so associative, unital, um, but also idempotent. So a set union itself is 
is uh, the set itself, and a set intersect itself is also the set itself. Um, so that's additional laws. Finally, uh, vector spaces are, are a uh, set with a, an addition operation on it that forms an abelian group. And then with an uncountable, no well, depends on what field, if we're working over the reals, you have an uncountable number of unary operations, one for each uh, field element, one for each real number. So you can have, you're allowed to have lots and lots and lots of operations, but you have to describe everything in terms of those operations. What's not uh, an algebraic theory? Fields, yeah? Single sorted, yeah. Yeah. In, in GATLAB, we do multi sorted. I like multi sorted, but we're, we're keeping things simple. Fields are not an algebraic theory. Why? Because division, um, you, you can't divide by zero. So in, in the division operation, you have to qualify. You have to say, for all x where x is not equal to zero, you can divide by it. Um, but you can't express that in algebraic theories. Another one, even simpler, is like principal ideal domains. Um, you, you can't express the property of being a principal ideal domain as in terms of like operations uh, and so on. So now let's try and talk about formally defining what an algebraic theory is. So the start is you have a signature. A signature consists of, for all n, uh, a set of operations, a set of n area operations. And th that's actually all it is. It's just for each n, you have a set. So the signature for a magma is just the empty set for all n except for n equals 2. And then for n equals 2, you have just a singleton set. Signature for a monoid has um, empty except for n equals 2 and n equals 0 because the uh, identity element is a zero ary operation. Lattices have more stuff. Vector spaces have an uncountable many um, uh, unary operations. Um, and when you have a signature, you can say a model for the signature. Um, consists of um, for all f in O n, we think of f as like a function symbol. Yeah? Is this just going to hold for a fixed n, for all n, for? For, for all n. Yeah. So a model consists of for all n and for all f big O of n, uh, an interpretation of f. Uh, oh, <laughs> consists of a set X interpretation of F as an actual n operation. Um, so, so, but, so this allows us to do magmas, but this does not allow us to do monoids because we do not have, we do not yet have a concept of equation. So in order to have a concept of equation, we need a concept of term. A term is, uh, it's inductively defined as either a free variable being deliberately vague about what this means because that's kind of 
the vibe of, uni of, of classical universal algebra. They don't have a very well-defined story for dealing with variables. We'll do, a better we'll do it in a better way in the categorical story. It's either a free variable or it's a function symbol applied to terms. So for instance, if we're working in the theory of rings, you could have like a times b plus a times c. That would be a term in the theory of rings. Um, and if, we have, if you have a model and you have a term and you have a, um, you pick an element of your model for each free variable in the term, you can interpret that term in, in sort of the obvious way. You, you just, when, how do you interpret a free variable? Well, you, you know the value of it. How do you interpret a function symbol applied to terms? Well, you recursively evaluate the terms. Um, so in this case, you'd evaluate A times B and you'd evaluate A times C. And then you use your interpretation of the function symbol to get the value of the overall thing. I'm not going to write that out, but def interpret blah, blah, blah. You're saying if you have a map from variables to elements, a map from B to X, and given like yeah. an, a, the, a syntax thing in, in B, you would get a syntax thing in X and therefore a thing in X? That's how it works under the hood. Yes, <laughs> but you don't have to necessarily make that st step to like go to a thing in X, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's implicitly parentheses here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what is it? So now we can talk about axioms. An axiom is a pair of terms with the same free variables. Or like, yeah, so we, ha we have a set of free variables v and then two terms in those three variables. And um, a model satisfies uh, an axiom LR, pair of terms, if with all assignments of these two, uh, sorry, of to F these L and R have same interpretation. So we implicitly for all quantify over all choices of like ways to assign uh, actual values to A and B and A and C. And then we could, for instance, require this to be equal to A times B plus C. It'd be the distributive law for, for a ring. Um, so now we can define a theory consists of a signature, a set of axioms, and a model of a theory is 
model of signature satisfying. Actions. Yes. Since the interpretation is defined by the model, is the actual content of the sets in the signature important at all, or can we just reduce it to a cardinality? Um, the actual content of the set. It's, m it's a meaningless concept to a category theorist. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The, the content is like how you interpret the, I mean, yeah, you could just have it be a cardinality, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes, from a computational perspective, sometimes you want this, you care about the content because then that makes the interpretation easier to compute. Oh, no, I'm asking but, about yeah. the content of X, I'm asking about the content of ON. Oh, yeah, you all, oh, yeah, that, that also you only care about the cardinality. Yeah. Um, but you might give names to them, and you might want to remember what the names are, because <laughs> that's convenient. But yeah, yeah, you only care about the cardinality, well, formally. Well, what was the, yeah, was there a button for only doing any cardinality in the first place? No. <laughs> I mean, it's useful, to, it's useful to write down, like, plus times instead of two. Okay, so this was universal algebra. We're done with the one star material. Now we're ready for adjoint functors. Now, this is gonna be a little bit of like a, whoa. And now for something completely different, Monty Python style. But, um, but it'll, it'll all come together into a, beautiful, into a beautiful cohesive whole. Um, we're going to start out with something not to a field. So um, consider a category of sets and the category of monoids. There's a functor from monoids to sets, which sends each monoid to its underlying set. So yeah, a, a monoid. Yeah, a monoid is a model of the theory of mo monoids. So it consists of a set and then definition of an operation. Operations. We just forget everything except for the set. It's called, often called a forgetful functor. There's also a functor going in the opposite direction. Um, called. This is called the free functor. And what this does is it sends a set X um, equals what off people sometimes call X star or list X, which is um, so these are two, like tuples of elements of x of arbitrary length. And this is a monoid with concatenation. So if we have like a, b, c times b, d, this is just like a, b, c, b, d. Um, if, like, we start with x equals a, b, d. So now, uh, these, this is a pair of adjoint functors. And we're going to learn three different definitions for this. Concept so nice, he defined it thrice. 
Um, so the first one, I'm going to refer to this by isomorphism of um, sets. This means that if I have uh, x a set y monoid, then hom sub mnd fxy is equivalent to hom set xuy. So what does this mean? Well, so this is the set of uh, monoid homomorphisms from f of x to y. This is the set of just functions from x to u of y. And this says that a monoid homomorph, there, there's, an there's a natural isomorphism. So yeah, nat natural isomorphism is a category theory term, but we're, we don't have to go into exactly what that means if you're not familiar with it. But basically, it means that there's a natural way of saying, OK, if I have a monoid homomorphism from f of x to y, then I have a function from u, from, from x to u of y. And how do I figure that out? Well, a monoid homomorphism here is determined by where it sends the singleton strings. So like, all I have to do is figure out where I send like A, where I send B, uh, and so on. So given a monoid homomorphism, I I like look at where I send all the singleton strings and then use that to build a function from just the elements of x to the elements of y. This is just an arbitrary function. There's no monoid structure here. Court, going the other direction, if I have a function here where I, I get for every element of x, I, I get an, uh, an element of y, just a function without any structure, I can build a monoid homomorphism here. Because I send a string, like A, B, C, like I send a string, you know, A, B, D, this just maps to, if my function here is F, F of A times F of B means F of D. There's only one, there's only one place to send this. So this is the, the first perspective. The second perspective on adjoints is unit and co-unit. Um, so two functors are uh, adjoint if there's a natural transformation um, eta sub x going from x to u f x. Uh, and um, and then a, I can't remember the traditional name for this, so I was calling this mu. What's the tradition? Epsilon. Epsilon. Epsilon sub x y going from f u y to y. And how do we interpret this? in terms of this example? Well, here we send a uh, element of x to the uh, singleton string here. Because u, f of x is the monoid of strings. u of f of x is just the underlying set there. So we can send an element of x to the singleton string there. This on the other hand, this, we have a string of elements of y. And we need to send that some, to somewhere in y. Well, y is a monoid. So we can just take this string and, and multiply them all together. Um, and these satisfy some, some laws, um, which the easiest way to remember these laws is um, 
I mean, this is the way I, I always have to remember the, them. Basically, you can visualize these operations as um, string diagrams. So the way you read this is that uh, this goes from, uh, we flip the order of composition, but this, this is a map from top to bottom. And it goes from the identity, because that's just x. The identity on shaded, we're making shaded be set to the composition of F and U. So empty is monoid. Um, it's a little weird, but yeah, th then eta turns out to be like this, this, this cup. And correspondingly, epsilon is, is this cap. And um, the, the laws are that this equals this and maybe this, yeah, where um, This is U, F, U. This is just U, F. This is F, U, F. Um, and basically what these express, yeah, I, I, this is more of, a, this is less of an explanation and more of a teaser for cool diagrammatic languages in, in, in category theory. But basically what this expresses is that um, these are compatible in, in some sense where if you, let's see, if you start, uh, if you start with an X and then you make like a singleton of it and then you evaluate that singleton, you get, if you start with, you start with u y, yeah. If you start with an element of u y, and then make a singleton of it, of it, and then evaluate it, then you will get back to the same thing. And then there's a corresponding one. Uh, so this is a, this is perhaps a little a little mysterious, but but the fact that these are equivalent re really is saying that like. All that matters, oh, oh, and one thing that you should notice is that, so where, does, where do these come from? Well, these come from transposing the identity f of x to f of x. Like, f of x to f of x is equivalent by this homomorphism to uh, u to u f x. So we can take the identity here and turn it into a morphism here. And similarly here, this comes from the identity UY to UY. Okay, and now the third perspective on adjoint functors. Um, I'm gonna erase this. is that f of x is the um, initial object 
of the category of the following objects. The objects of this category are, um, well, monoid y along with a map from x to u y. And then the maps are um, y prime. So basically, an object of this is a monoid along with a map from x into the underlying set of that monoid. And, and so the initial object here is whenever you have, is, is an object that satisfies the property of whenever you have a map from x into um, f of x, sorry, yeah, when, sorry, whenever you have a map from x into u of y, then you have a map from f of x into y um, by initiality. So, yeah, the in, in, initiality says that, like, initiality of f of x, um, oh, there's the, the, um, there's the unit. You always have this triangle that factors whenever you have this map. Yes, yes. And then you can do a similar thing just by dualizing to get uh, uy is terminal of like x and then fx to y. Um, and this is just flipping everything around. I'm running. Well, I'm not running so late on time, but I have a lot of other stuff that I want to go through. So that's adjoints. So you can think about adjoints in three ways. One, with this isomorphism of Hom sets. Two, uh, with unit and co-unit. And three, with this initial terminal um, set up. And, and this last one is what gives you, is what really should be giving you the intuition for free and, and forgetful, or at least for free. Because really this is saying like, all I want from this is a map from x into u, y. So give me like, give me like the most basic thing that, give, that has a map from, give me the most basic y that, that has a map from x in, into the, the underlying set. Categorical algebraic theories. Part three. So, we learned in the first section that an algebraic theory is characterized by a collection of n area operations and then also a collection of laws. We want to turn this into category theory. However, morphisms in a category are unary in that like, you know, a function just goes from its domain to its codomain. So we have to somehow bolt in n area operations into, the theory, into category theory. Uh, there are several ways to do this. Um, we could, instead of looking at categories, we could look at multi-categories or operads. We could also look at monoidal categories. For a variety of reasons, the, the, like, it turns out that that's not what we want for this. What we want is to do it with products. So this is pretty simple. We just make a binary operation, the amorphism, a times a to a, 
where this is uh, the categorical product defined in terms of a universal property. Um, namely, that there is, uh, is A, there's projections, pi 1 and pi 2, and moreover, um, A times A is the terminal <laughs> ob object with these maps out. So any time we have another B with maps in here, there exists a unique series. Incidentally, you can frame this. As, so if you have a category C, um, then there's, there's always a map from C to C squared, which just duplicates. This is the right adjoint. So that adjoints are everywhere. Um, in any case, so yeah, so we want, we want, we're going to formalize uh, algebraic theories using products. Um, and this allows us to sort of build up, we can build up terms. So if we assume that, say, we have like plus like this and times as a morphism here and then maybe zero uh, I, I meant I, I do mean subtraction uh, or, or, or negation and then zero as a morphism from one to a um, well we can build up like a complicated term we, we can say do like X plus negative x. This is a morphism um, a to a times a, a times a to a. We're going to put a plus here. We make this identity on a and then minus. So we're, we're applying like two morphisms. And then here um, we, do, we, we have the diagonal. So basically, you take something in A, copy it twice, apply negative to one of them, and then apply plus here. Um, we can also, so this is the, the unique map from A to one, and this is zero. So requiring this diagram to commute expresses that x plus negative x equals zero. So, this sort of gives us an intuition that how are we, we're going to express our operations by morphisms in a category with products, and we're going to express our laws by the diagrams that commute. So this is, this is our inspiration for the following definition. with products such that um, every object isomorphic to A to the N for some N for a fixed A. So what does this mean? Um, it means so we have a category T. It has a special object in it. 
Every other object in that category is isomorphic to the n-fold product of that object with itself. Um, moreover, uh, it's isomorphic to only one of them. So this sort of rules out the situation. You know, yeah, yeah. But is it, do we have to have one object that's isomorphic to A, or could they start by being isomorphic to A, to a squared, and then another one could be A cubed? No, no, there, there's one fixed A, and then everything is isomorphic to, every, everything else is isomorphic to A to the N. For some, maybe so I didn't understand. One object that is isomorphic to A to one. Uh, there could be multiple. There could be multiple things that are isomorphic to each other, that are. But like there, like there could be multiple things isomorphic to A to the one. Could be multiple multiple things isomorphic to A to the two. <laughs> <laughs> David knows I'm doing something non-traditional. <laughs> um, and yeah, so example. Thin set. Thin set is not an example. <laughs> um, thin set every object in FinSet is isomorphic to the coproduct of one with itself that, that many times. So like x is isomorphic to the coproduct over x in x of one. So then, but we can just dualize. So if we make FinSet up, well, Products are dual to coproducts. So in FinSet op, everything is isomorphic to a product. And so, so FinSet op is a, is a Lever theory. Um, and FinSet op is sort of the, the simplest Lever theory in a sense. Because FinSet op really has no operations. No, no interesting binary or unary operations. All it has is the projections. Um, so you can have like a times a pi one to a. Um, and this corresponds to like one. This, this map. Uh, in the, we think of this as a map like that. Yes. Um, and in fact, it's sort of defined to be the initial Lever theory because I'm going to say that um, the category of there. Is um, is the full full means it well f full subcat full subcategory so a full subcategory is something which is just determined by the objects so you pick a subset of objects of a category and then any morphism that goes between those objects is in your subcategory of fin set op co sliced over cat. So, what this means is that an, an object of this consists of a category with a morphism from fin set op into that category on funk doors. Um, uh, K fin set op set that are um, 
uh, the, the product preserving and bijective on objects. So there's some evil e evilness here. Uh, and David is shaking his head because he knows that the objects of this are not exactly the, what is defined to be there. Um, <laughs> um, so basically what this means is that there's an object for every finite set. Um, and the the like there are the there are the appropriate uh, projection morphisms between those objects. It's more traditional to instead of fin set, um, you make this a skeleton of fin set where the objects are the natural numbers. Um, the reason I like I kind of like having fin set here is because I like to think that there's an object in T for each collection of variables. So like there's an object in T for the collection of variables x, y, z. And this may or may not be isomorphic. Or this is isomorphic, but it's not equal to the collection for a, b, c. Um, just because I like to give names to my variables. Oh, uh, f f sorry, fun functors, yeah, yes. It, or I should really call this T to be consistent. So yeah, so an object of this category is a category T along with a functor from here. Um, and then this functor is product preserving and, and bijective on objects. And notice the fact that it's for product preserving and bijective on objects means that T has to have all products. <laughs> okay. So, and we are going to call this um, ALG theory. This is the, the category ALG theory. Yeah, I'm viewing this as an ordinary category. More naturally defined. Yes. Um, but notice the natural transformations. Yeah, there's there's ways of thinking about natural transformations in this context, but they actually don't come into play too much in the way that we've set it up here. Not that I know of, at least. Um, and I think it's because of this like evil, <laughs> this sort of evil condition, which is that we're, we're, we're making it be bijective on objects instead of like essentially surjective or essentially bijective. Okay. Okay. Um, we have two more things. Here, okay, so this is the basics of Lavert theories. Finally, to, to finish up the basics of Lavert theories, we say, uh, def a model. Okay. okay. A T to set. So this picks out a um, this picks out a set by where it sends a the sort of the generator, and then this also tells us this also for like each morphism in here we get an actual function here. So that's how this is connected to like the classical notion of of, of model. Because, yeah, for, for like function A and A, this is F, 
little f we, we get um, f of f going from sort of a n f of a. Yes? So given one of these things, is it easy to recover the thing that you made the theory to represent in the first place? So for instance, you said that magmas can be represented as uh, as the theories, or the, 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 the theory of magma. Yeah. If I then express that in category theoretic terms, can I recover the category of magmas? Um, the category of magmas, yeah, I was going to get this, get, get to this in, in, a, in a bit, but yeah, the, the category of magmas is then the category of functors from T, the category of product preserving functors from T to Z with natural transformations between them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so anytime, anytime you, you write down your algebraic theory, you automatically get a notion of homomorphism between them. It's, it's the natural transformations between these functors. Okay. Um, how do we build something interesting that's not FinSet? Well, uh, there's, there's, the, the answer is really slick with adjoint functors. So there's a functor from alg theory to set to the n, which sends um, t maps to the function that sends n to um, palm, T A E N A. Yeah, so well this doesn't quite recover the signature because this also gets like all sorts of complex terms. Um, like this this gets, you know, this is is a morphism from A to A. So it gets that. It's not just like the primitive things in the signature. However, we can, take the, so we can take the left adjoint to this, and given a signature, which is an element of this, we then get a Lavert theory. And this, this allows us to get the Lavert theory for magmas when we start with um, precisely one binary operation. Now the question is, how can we, put, how can we get laws in? Um, well, laws, we need to, we need to sort of take our morphisms in the Lever, in like when we just go from here to here, our morphisms become essentially syntax trees, and they're syntax trees up to equality, so um, you, you, don't, you don't get any, any non-trivial uh, commuting diagrams. How do you, how do you, um, how do you, so, okay, let, let me start writing letters. Call this F, S, and F. How do you get equations? Well, you, you make two signatures, one signature of generators and one signature of equations. And then you have something that looks like this. And this essentially says for each equation, I have a left and a right side. And then um, in order to get the, the Lavert theory presented by this, I take the co-equalizer of fx, um, this is f tilde, g tilde, like I transpose them according to the adjoint, fy. So this says basically take the, take the, the free Lavert theory on these generators and then quotient by everything that you need to make the equations hold true. The category of the Lavert theory has co-equalizers? Category of the Lavert theory has co-equalizers, co yes. Okay, let's see, what do, what do we have? Okay, I think I have time for semantics and then a quick software demo. We don't have time for the forgetful functor to set, unfortunately. 
I will take questions. Um, but this is this is this is where things really start to get cooking, which is that there's a functor from Alge theory to cat, which sends T goes to functor functors that are preserving from T to set, um, which we're going, this is going to be called the category of models of T. And so what does this, well, okay, so first of all, this is a category. So what, given any T, we get uh, a notion of homomorphism between models of T. But even better, if we have F going from T to T prime, and we have a model of T prime, well, uh, let's call this M, then we can make um, M compose F. So that, so we get a functor from models of T prime to models of T. So this allows, for instance, you know, any monoid has a magma. Any ring has an underlying abelian group. Um, so there, there's like an inclusion of the theory of abelian groups into um, the theory of rings, and we can pull back along that. And there's an adjoint. There's always an adjoint to this. So we, we always have a pair of adjoint functions. Uh, so this is F star, F upper star goes like this. F lower star goes like this. Given a, given a model of T prime, we can get a model of T. And given a model of T prime, we can push it forward. So this, this allows us to do things like the, uh, a group ring. We can take the, if you have any group, you can build a ring where, um, which is like polynomials in the variables of the group. Um, this also allows you to say, like take the free monoid on a set, or the free monoid on a magma, or the free vector space on a group. Um, all of that just comes all from this theory. So yeah, I think that's, I'm gonna end there.